So Nick Drake was 26 years old when he died, when he committed suicide. <laughs> what happened to Nick? What happened to him and what, is, what actually can happen to a lot of people? Why he developed depression? Well, he had a genetic predisposition. This is what we call gene-environment interaction and what is what we believe actually can cause depression. So he had a genetic predisposition and he had a trigger, he had a stress. We knew he was not able to cope and that trigger is depressed state. And probably the trigger was actually the failure of his three albums. And he actually said this to many of his friends. He was really sad about this. So to develop depression, we need to have something in our genes that gave us, can give us the predisposition. And we need a stress. Now, some people have genes that can predispose to have cardiovascular disorders. They can actually get viral infections for cancer if uh, they have genes that actually alter, that control the immune system. They can even develop obesity or have some kind of other metabolic syndromes. And there are people that actually have genes that affect the central nervous system. And when they have distress, with whom they cannot cope anymore, they can develop what is called an affective disorders. And between these affective disorders, we have depression. Let's go a little bit about the epidemiology. So depression is an horrible disorder. It's a really incredible public menace nowadays. Uh, it's affecting more than 121 million people around the world. 30 million are affected only in Europe. It's an incredible economic burden for the European community. And these are actually very recent values. So it's 118 euro billion per year that are spent to take care of depressed people. This is extremely important, and you will see this really extremely important for all the presentation. We have a big issue. So between 30 to 50% of patients do not respond, or are partially responders, to the current antidepressant treatment. And unfortunately, as we have seen, between 10 to 15% of patients do commit suicide. What is even more worrying is what the World Health Organization has actually estimated. They've estimated that by 2013, the amount of worldwide disability and the life lost, the life lost, which can be attributed to depression will be greater, greater than any other condition, including cancer, stroke, heart disease, accidents, and war. So we are talking about the huge numbers in here and a very, very worrying prediction by the World Health Organization. How the diagnosis of depression is, is done, actually, if, if you look at the little summary that it was for my talk, how can we actually be able to distinguish between sadness, which is normal, it's normal to be sad, it's part of human evolution. We need to be sad if we then want, you know, to raise up. We developed sadness as human beings for something. It's a way to protect ourselves and then to come back. What is wrong is that when we get sad and when we don't come back, okay? So how depression is, how is made the diagnosis? So there is a manual for psychiatrists, which is used in the United States, but is also used in, uh, in Europe very much. It's called DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual. We arrived now at the fifth version. So they, what they say is that five of more of the following symptoms have to be displayed nearly every day during the same two weeks. So if, if they have to show those symptoms for two weeks, okay? For a diagnosis which is based, be very careful here, this is a very important message, is only based on a questionnaire. There is no biological marker or anything that we can actually measure on a person and say, you are depressed because you have this which is altered in your, in your blood, because you have this that is altered in your brain. There's nothing at the moment. There is a questionnaire. The questionnaire that we use is called Hamilton. But, you know, there is one part of the body that depression is, already, is really eating very bad, okay? And this is the brain. Again, I'm using literature here to help us. It was Oscar Wilde. He was saying that it is in the brain that everything takes place. It is in the brain that the pop is red, that the apple is odorous, that the skylark sings. It is in the brain that we feel emotions. And depression is a disease of emotions. So what are, what are actually the brain symptoms? that depression is giving us, it's affecting a lot of, you know, what our brain can do. So a depressed patients can have problems with attention, with memory, with executive functions, so which means, you know, in being, having indecisions, a lacking of confidence, procrastination, 
also, you know, the way in which we move depends on the brain, so the psychomotor speed. So all these are actually affected in our depressed patients. And the final common outcome is that a depressed patient feels confused, inadequate, overwhelmed. So the brain, the brain is actually it by depression. What is the brain? Let's get a little bit academic in here. So this is the brain. The brain in humans is formed by two major parts, which is the forebrain and the brainstem, okay? So the forebrain is actually prominent in mammals and birds, and it's responsible for most conscious behavior. So this is where actually we can feel the emotions. We can develop the memories, and we can put the emotions and the memory together. And then there is the brainstem, which is coming from the past, okay? The brainstem, for example, reptiles, they have a very huge brainstem. This is a source of behavior in simple, simpler animals, responsible for most of our unconscious behavior. The instinct to survive, for example, eating, sexual behavior as well, part at least. Of the forebrain, there is one part which is extremely important in depression, and it's composed by at least, I would say, three brain regions. The brain is not, on, you know, it's more, we have to consider the brain more as a system composed of different organs, which are the brain regions. And each brain region is in charge of something, okay? The part of the brain which is it by depression is called the limbic system. And there are three main parts. The hippocampus, which is responsible for the memory. The amygdala, which is responsible for our emotions of fear. And the prefrontal cortex, which is actually very much in charge of emotions, but is also putting all these inputs together. So emotions, sexual behaviors, memory, spatial navigations, how do we move around the place? What do we have in the brain? In the brain, we have two types of cells. We have the neurons and we have the glial cells, which are also very important. So the neurons, they carry out the brain's major function. Well, just to give you an amazing number, so we have at least 80 billion neurons in our brain. This is a universe. It's huge. We have also the glial cells. They're very important because they support the surviving and the functions of the neurons, and they are more than the neurons. We have actually 100 billion glial cells in our brain. Um, I just don't want to get too much difficult in here, but what we have uh, in the neuron, no, there is another <coughs> one, no. Okay, so essentially the way in which it works in the brain is that we hit the way in which one neuron contact another, another neuron is like that. So this part of the neuron in here is called axon and goes in contact with another part of the neuron, which is called dendrite, okay? Now, the space which is formed between the axon, which is called presynaptic terminal, and the part of the dendrite which is in contact, which is called dendritic spine, is called synaptic cleft. And there are a lot of things that actually happen in here. This is the way in which the neurons communicate to each other. This is how an input is passed from one neuron to another. It is very important for the functioning of the brain, okay? So what is actually released by the dendrite in this space that then is taken up again by the dendrite to continue this flow. And then from the dendrite, it will go to the axon, then from the axon to another drain, then and go on. What is actually happening in there, and what is released in this space, is what is called neurotransmitter. This is for us important to then understand how antidepressant drugs work. So a, ne a neurotransmitter is a chemical substance which is released by the axon, it diffuses through the synaptic cleft or synapses, and go to the dendrite of the other neurons. Between the neurotransmitters, we have many neurotransmitters. What is important for depression is the monoamines. And the monoamines, why? Because they are involved in the regulation of memory process, other cognitive process, such as emotion, arousal. And in between them, we have some that probably you already heard about them. They are very famous. We have dopamine. Noradrenaline, they're part of a family which is called catecholamines. And we have then serotonin, probably heard about serotonin. 
It's very famous. So mono means that actually it looks like that there are altered in depression and that gave rise to what is called the monominergic or the monomine hypothesis of depression. This hypothesis states that, the mono, that actually there is an alteration in the levels of monomines in the brain. And this involves all the three of them, so serotonin, noradrenaline and dopamine. Alterations in the levels means that the level of those monomines is decreased in the brain. And this is how antidepressant drugs work. They increase the levels of these monomines in the brain and they are supposed to make people feel better by recovering the alteration they had in these monomines. The antidepressant drugs, I would like to say something else about the antidepressant drugs. You know, they are superstars. Probably know Prozac, Paxil, Lexapro, these are all names we are familiar with. There's also something else which probably we need to be familiar with because it's very important. It is a huge market for the pharmaceutical industry. These numbers are coming from the United States where actually antidepressants for the mental health drugs, they represent, they're on the top, they're antipsychotics a little bit more, but they actually the value of this market is $20 billion per year. Is huge. This has to open the eyes to a lot of things, and I will go on that. What kind of antidepressant drugs do we have and how they've been developed? The first antidepressant drugs were called MAO inhibitors. So now MAO is an enzyme which is called monoamine oxidase. What's, what MAO is doing is to degradate the monomines when they are still inside the axon, okay? MAO inhibitors are drugs that actually inhibit this enzyme, so there is more of these monomines available and more monomines are released. These were the first to be used. They were discovered by chance because the first MAO inhibitor was used for tuberculosis. It makes feel the patients better, but there are a lot of side effects coming with it, so they had to go to other drugs. And these are called the first generation of antidepressant drugs, they are called tricyclic antidepressant drugs or TCIS, and what they do is to block, <coughs> because what happens is when, uh, one, when these monomines are released in the synaptic cleft, then they are retransported inside the dendrites, okay? These drugs, they block the reuptake of the drugs inside dendrites, so at the end there are more monomines available, so somehow it's an indir indirect way to increase again the levels of monomines, okay? Tricyclic antidepressants, are very specific, they increase all of the three monomines and they have also heavy side effects. So the pharmaceutical industry thought, okay, we need to go to something else. This is the second generation of antidepressants, which are the antidepressants that we mainly use nowadays. So they can be selective to a specific monomine and it looks like for some reason that serotonin was the one that the industry decided to choose as the one to target. So the new drugs are called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. And one of those drugs is, was, now it's still used, especially in the United States, in Europe we are using something else. But one of these drugs was Prozac, extremely famous, the epi pill, which is not really the epi pill at all. So Prozac, which is also called fluoxetine, this is the chemical which is inside it, okay? So let's talk about the limitations of antidepressant drugs. The clinical efficacy of the drugs is reached only after four, eight weeks of treatment. So the depressed person needs a lot of discipline. Taking the drug at the same time every day and the benefit will be only after four or eight weeks. There are also some side effects which are very disturbing. And actually, you know what happened is that the patient feel these side effects during the first weeks, so before having the benefits. And this is why we are actually facing something that is called discontinuation of treatment. They feel the side effects and they don't want to take the drug anymore, okay? Between the side effects, the one that is really disturbing people is sexual dysfunction, 
but drugs like floxetine, Prozac, can give a lot of anxiety as well during the first weeks. Gastrointestinal issues as well, this can be terrible. And again, I repeat this again, 50% of patients do not respond to this at all. So the question, how can we beat the disease of the 21st century? We need, we must address three main needs 